I've been making videos about board games now for seven years. When I first started out, my role was played by this small child. But when I first started making videos, I'd only been playing games properly for three years. Now I've been playing them for 10. So my tastes have completely changed. The way I see games is so different. So I thought it'd be really interesting to go back to the first videos I made, to look at what I said about those games and decide, would I still recommend them? Are they still in my collection? We're gonna review the reviews. If you wanna check out the original reviews, I've put links in the description below and I've put links if you wanna buy any of the games. If you use them, a small cut will go towards this channel and help me keep making videos. Thanks. This is my first ever review. It's of a party game called Fun Employed. Some board games give us a taste of life at its most brutal. Whether it's fighting on the front lines of World War II in Memoir 44. <laughs> this, is, this is such a long, drawn out joke. And just my face whilst I'm saying it, I'm, I, it's just like I'm so disinterested, but really I was just so nervous. Each round, one player will take on the role of the interviewer, turning over a job card, say psychic, and every other player will then take it in turns to pitch for the job using their unique hand of qualification cards. It's then up to the interviewer to decide who gave the best reasons, who had the best pitch, and that person wins the round. That's a pretty good description of the game. That's the great thing about Fun Employed is that it acts like the setup to a joke with the player providing a punchline. So the idea of using a lisp as a reason to get a job as a proctologist, that's a funny idea in itself, but it's your execution of that idea that brings the joke home. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You get given the setup, but you get to deliver that punchline. And that's what makes games like this really good. And crucially, it's still you making your friends laugh. It's not the cards doing the work for you, like happens in Cards Against Humanity. Fun Employed is fun because it's you being funny. You get to be creative. The game helps you along as far as you need. So it's not hard to be funny, but you, you don't get the kind of agency taken away from you like in Cards Against Humanity. There was a, a real common vibe in the community that Cards Against Humanity was like this big success story but didn't deserve it because it was bad for all these reasons. It was definitely a whipping boy for people that love board games passionately and I was leaning into that because Fun Employed is kind of a great alternative to it. And ultimately then I play, I made another video that was alternatives to Cards Against Humanity to really hammer it home. The style of humour is created by the group, not by the game. And so it's not a game forcing a sense of humour on you. Yeah, exactly. The game is fun for your friends because your friends get to determine the level and you bring your sense of humour to it. If you're very wholesome and you don't like swearing and being rude, then you can play it that way. And if you are the opposite of that, you can play it that way. The artwork is great. The card quality is great. The Artwork is great. The card quality is great. Who cares? Fun Employed won't work for everyone. Um, if you've got any friends that are particularly shy or they don't like to talk in front of groups of people, then they might not go for this game. So this is the crucial point of the review. And I would emphasize this much more now than I did back then. Fun Employed is a great game for a very small group of people. So would I still recommend the game? Yes, with a big asterisk. I still own Fun Employed, but I hardly ever get to play it because it needs the perfect group. It needs people that are all into it, that are willing to improvise and try and be funny. And I found a lot of people find it embarrassing. They are very nervous in the game. They don't enjoy it because of that. It's a tricky game for me to bring out. I don't like to make people feel uncomfortable or have a bad time. So I'm never going to bring it out in front of people that I think wouldn't vibe with it. And that's most people that I know. If you're in the market for a party game, it doesn't get much better than this. This <laughs> is If you're in the market for a party game, it doesn't get much better than this. And that's it. The same music. I somehow, I just found some music through YouTube to end a video with, and it's been the same every single video for seven years. And I really would love to change it, but I just never, there's never a good time to spend time on that job. So it, you're always better making a video as a YouTuber than fixing things like that. So we've got the same music, we've got the same ident music for seven years.
<laughs> My second ever review was of Deception Murder in Hong Kong, which is a social deduction hidden traitor game. And I'd actually got the original version of this, CS Files, from Hong Kong. It's one of the few games where I paid extra to order it from another country, and it was worth it. The game was actually good. Looks like somebody hasn't been feeling too stairwell. So this is my first attempt at a sketch. This was filmed in the stairwell of the block of flats we used to live in. And the dead body is played by my friend Phil. I think this might be the only video that he's in. And you can see that his legs like up the stairs to fit in the shot. He got really uncomfortable in that position because I was doing so many takes. They tell me you're the best damn forensic scientist in the city. You can see here that we covered a table with kitchen foil to make it look like a metal slab that they would have in a forensics lab. And this is one of the only times where I've tried to have me in the same shot. And you can see there's a line where the lighting is different. It's just way too hard to try and do stuff like this, especially on your own. So I gave up this idea after doing this video. One of the detectives is the murderer who's trying to stay hidden throughout the game. The good guys win by correctly identifying the right piece of evidence and murder weapon. One player knows that information, the forensic scientist, but he can't talk to the other good guys. He must communicate the information he knows to the detectives by placing pawns on the six tiles in the center of the table. The forensic scientist will have to give a location where the murder happened or um, a noise that's in the background or something that was found at the crime scene, but they have to pick from six options. So they can't just say whatever they want. They have to pick something that is closest to the murder weapon um, that they think is gonna give people a hint in that direction. So they're having to use quite blunt instruments to communicate something. And the other players are really having to do a lot of deduction with the information they've been giving because it's so vague and weird. Uh, and that is what creates a load of discussion and what makes the game so fun because you're really trying to interpret those clues and it gives you that room for the traitor who's trying to stay hidden and not get caught. It gives them room to go, well, no, that is not pointing towards my card. It's clearly pointing towards your card. How can you say it is me? I don't even own a scarf. Oh God, my French accent in this video is so bad. You can see in the background how messy my kitchen is. So I obviously didn't decide to wash up before making this video. In games like The Resistance, new players can find it hard to get involved in the discussion. But here, new players are straight in. Anyone can have a discussion as to why a scarf makes more sense for suffocation than packing tape. Yeah, I think Deception is probably the most entry-level hidden traitor game. And not because the rules are any simpler, but because I think it's just got a wider appeal. It's more approachable. It's less demanding on the players in terms of bluffing and deduction. One of the great things about Deception Murder in Hong Kong is there's no metagaming to it. It is really just arguing over, do you think this means scarf or does it mean packing tape? What are you talking about, packing tape? You suffocate people with a scarf. Everybody knows that. There's a pause here where I just clearly can't remember the next line. You could probably go back to my videos and spot where I'm like, you can see the cogs whirring where I'm trying to remember the next line and there's this pause and then, oh, okay, that's what I meant to say. And it gives the traitor something to work with. No more are they just protesting their innocence. It isn't me, I didn't do it. Now they have an argument to make. It's not a scarf, it's the poisonous gas. Yeah, that's a great point about this game. You're not just saying, I'm not the spy, believe me you can come up with a reason why people should look elsewhere. You can try and find some logic that links the clues elsewhere. Now, sometimes the clues are so good or they just hit the nail on the head that you actually get trapped and you, you can't really think of a good reason for people to vote elsewhere. But most of the time, there is some blurriness that you can play with and that's why it's fun being a traitor. It's different enough from the resistance that you can still enjoy both. I think it scratches completely different itches for me at, at least. And if you don't like the resistance, you still should check this out because it may fix the table talk problem that some people suffer with. Yeah, this is the crucial point of the review and I absolutely agree with it all. Deception feels so different to the resistance or werewolf or secret Hitler, which are different from each other, but all kind of 
feel the same on some level and deception offers something quite different, which is why I still have it in my collection. And yes, I would absolutely still recommend this game. I mean, I wish the box was smaller. This is actually the expansion box, um, but that's the only thing that I can fault it on. It offers something very different and you might hate those other social deduction games and still like Deception. Yeah, I played this as recently as a few months ago, had an absolute blast with a couple of games. It got really heated. There were some really big moments and it's just great for that kind of experience. So my third video was my top 10 couples games video. And this was my most successful video for the last seven years until I made my top 10 mistakes video a few months ago. So this is the most watched video or the second most watched video on my channel. Today I'm going to talk about my top 10 games for couples. <laughs> this guy's face, unbelievable. So I'll say about this video was that I love playing games with Serena. We played a lot of two player games, but I didn't have 10 really good ones to talk about. I probably had like seven or eight and I was really trying to get together 10 because I wanted to do a top 10 because everyone does top 10s. And so I was really scrabbling around and the ones at the end of the list are ones that I added quite last minute or I had only recently played a little bit. So it's just a little insight into what it's like to be a YouTuber early on and you're, you're pretending you know more than you do. Whereas nowadays I, I could recommend sort of 30 or more games for couples and find it really hard to pick a top 10. Back then, yeah, I only had six or seven. And number 10 is Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small, designed by Uwe Rosenberg. If you like worker placement games, then this is a great short one to play with your partner. And if you've never played worker placement games before, then this could be a great introduction to the genre. Yeah, I don't actually really describe why I like the game or what makes it interesting. And I think that sort of gives away that I wasn't that in love with Agricola, All Creatures Great and Small. And I wouldn't still recommend the game today. I got rid of it a long time ago. It felt quite samey and it just lacked a certain amount of excitement that I really want from a couples game. And number nine is the game, which is a cooperative card game. You each have a hand of six or seven cards and there are four piles in front of you, two going down from 100 and two going up from one. And on your turn, you have to place at least two of your cards into one of those four piles. The twist is you can't tell the other players what cards you have. There are better co-op games out there, but the reason I included the game on this list is that I think every couple's collection should have a simple co-op card game. Every couple should have, every couple's collection should have a simple co-op card game. Uh, I'm not sure that's 100% true. Yeah, I don't think I'd played the game enough at this point to really decide that it was in my collection long term. I got rid of it actually quite recently but that's partly because it's such a small box that it wasn't really taking up a lot of space on the shelf. So I allowed it to stay longer than it perhaps deserved. It's all right. You play it a few times. There's not really enough depth. You've kind of seen all the game has to offer. You appreciate that a lot, a lot of it's down to luck. It just feels like you're making obvious decisions. And that there isn't, even though you can't communicate with the other player, there isn't that much of the kind of mind reading that you would want from a game like that. And number eight is Carcassonne, designed by Klaus Jürgen Vreda. But it's also as competitive as you want it to be. Some people see it as a cutthroat game, whereas other people complain that it's too relaxed. But that's the great thing is you can choose whether to just focus on your own thing. I'm just gonna build my monastery here by my castle and let the nice man farm the land so he can feed his family or to go out of your way to sabotage your opponent. And I'm gonna put my road here, so you'll never be able to finish your castle and your man will never be able to leave. I think this captures a good aspect of Carcassonne, that some people can miss how cutthroat it can be, or some people play it in a much more like relaxed way. But I don't think it really gets to the heart of what makes Carcassonne interesting. It's a tricky one for a board game reviewer to get across and it doesn't help that it's sort of ugly and looks old, but there is ultimately a reason why it's so popular. And hopefully I did a better job of describing it in my latest 
uh, games for people that hate rules video. So yeah, I would absolutely still recommend Carcassonne. I think everyone needs to play it once to see if it's for them. And yeah, I still have a copy of it. In fact, there's a newer version. And I also have Carcassonne Hunters and Gatherers, which is a version that I slightly prefer because it's a bit more mean and there's a bit more excitement to it. I talk about it in one of my top 50 videos. And number seven is Battleline, designed by Reiner Knizia. Easy to learn, hard to master is a running theme of this list. And this is a great example of it. Yeah, easy to learn, hard to master. That's basically Reiner Knizia's epitaph. There are nine flags lined up on the table and you're playing cards on your side to try and win that flag. You either need to win three adjacent flags or five in total. You only have seven cards in your hand, so you have to gamble on the cards that you hope to get in the future. And you have to decide, do you want to focus on the flags that you want to win, or try and stop your opponent from getting the flags that they want? Yeah, I wish I'd emphasised that more, but it's the crux of the game is, what do you commit to now? You, you can't get all the cards that you need to, to build something out. You can't wait for cards to come in because you're always having to play something out. So where do you commit and, and where do you make those sacrifices or compromises? Your battle line is a game of making compromises and occasionally you'll hold out for a card and really hope for something good. And sometimes it will come off, but a lot of the time you do need to be tactically changing tack, pivoting to somewhere else because you can't just always be clinging on for the card you need. This is a great game for couples because it's quick, it's easy to learn, and you're going head to head with your opponent, but there's no aggression, there's no hurt feelings, you can't sabotage the other player, you're just doing what you need to to win. Yeah, I think this is a simple way to describe why Battle Line is so popular, and also Lost Cities, another game from Rainer Knizia, because you are competing with each other, but you're never directly attacking them or taking away from them. You're building up on your side, they're building up on their side. And so it's competitive, but there is no take that and it and you, you can't sort of be upset by what the other player's doing. Would I still recommend Battleline? Absolutely. I think it is one of the best two player games, one of the best couples games. It's a game that me and Serena have been playing for years. I now own the shot and totten version just because it's smaller and I slightly prefer the artwork. But Battle Line is just as good. They're basically the same game. So pick the one that you like. And number six is CV, designed by Philip Malinsky. CV is a game about telling a life and it uses a Yahtzee dice mechanism to try and win cards, to get jobs and different things throughout your life. So you sort of tell a story of a life. And that's a theme that's always really appealed to me. But what cliched analogy works better for life than throwing the dice and seeing what you get? Like, you might want that job as a CEO really badly, but luck isn't going your way. Damn it, I needed knowledge. You could gamble on it, waste a reroll, but the odds would be stacked against you. Or you could put your efforts into something more attainable. I guess I'll just take up marathon running instead. Yeah, this is really reminding me what I like about CV that such simple mechanisms get across much bigger thematic ideas. It's really an acute way. It's not like you're immersed in this world, but it just all clicks and works in a really satisfying way. Would I still recommend CV? Maybe. It does depend what you're looking for. I still have it in my collection, so that tells you something, but I haven't played it in a long time and I am put off by how long I remember it taking, it can bog down a bit. But the, the way it delivers on its theme, there's, there's a big part of that is, is my fondness for it. It maybe doesn't hold up with the kind of tight speediness that I would want from a game of this level if it was released today, but the theme kind of carries it into my collection and has made it stick around. So. It depends what you're looking for. And of course, if you like the theme, there is also a Pursuit of Happiness is another option. And number five is Patchwork by Uwe Rosenberg. Who would have thought a game about sewing a patchwork quilt would be any good? Well, I didn't, and then I tried it, and here we are at number five in the list. Yeah, Patchwork is amazing, and I think it's one of the games from this list that has really stood the test of time that people are still talking about and playing, and. If I was to make 
a top 10 now, Patchwork would still be in it. I feel like at the time it was hard to excite people about a game about quilting with like a brown cover. Over time, the word is really spread and, and now the pedigree of Patchwork is much, much higher that people really appreciate how good of a game it is. And now, of course, it's on Board Game Arena and it's probably the game on there that I've played the most because it's just so easy to enjoy and it's always the decisions are always tough and that satisfaction of trying to complete your puzzle and get everything and and sort of trying to reach the nirvana of having it all complete that still exists every single game that you play so yeah i love this one absolutely would still recommend patchwork it's been in my collection ever since i can't imagine this one ever leaving one of the best couples games around. Number four is Paperback, designed by Tim Fowers. Paperback is a deck building word game where you're using letter cards to build words to get points to buy more letters so that in the future you can build bigger and better words. Before modern board games came along and saved us all, there was one couples board game, Scrabble. But Scrabble had two problems with it. That the longest words weren't always the best, they didn't get the most points. Fluctuation. That's 19 points. Vent. V-E-N-T. Double letter on the V, triple word score. 33 points. Yeah, I think this captures something that frustrated me and more so Serena about Scrabble. Scrabble was one of those games that we were playing probably when we first started going out. And I would win more often because... I would game it more and focus on the double and triple letter scores. And of course that is the game, but it's frustrating when you come up with really good words and you use your letters perfectly. You've got an amazing vocabulary, but because of the placement, it's not worth anything. And that is frustrating. As far as I'm concerned, paperback is a Scrabble killer. Yeah, I mean, I don't think paperback is a Scrabble killer in the sense that they operate in different realms. You can't kill Scrabble with a game that's as complicated as Paperback. Would I still recommend Paperback? Yes, absolutely. I still own Paperback. Uh, it's not a game that I play very often. I think I'm turned off a bit by the setup of it. It's sort of true of any deck building game. When I'm playing a, a simple two player game with Serena, I want something that we can just get straight into. I've also played it a lot on the app, which is great fun. And so that sort of satisfies my paperback desires. Uh, so it means I'm less likely to play it in real life. But I absolutely think it's the best modern word game around. And number three is Arboretum, a card game that takes some inspiration from Lost Cities, which I hadn't played at this point and would now be in my top 10 couples game. And it's one that I was probably talking about a bit before Arboretum was like really big, or at least that's what I like to tell myself. Um, and now, of course, I think it's really understood how good of a game it is. Before I played Arboretum, I read the term hand management describing games and I never really got it. I just thought it just meant organizing cards in your hand. I didn't really see that there was much management required. Arboretum is more than just hand management. It's hand obsession, hand desperation, hand regret. I can't discard that. I can't discard that. I can't discard that. I can't discard that. Can't discard that. Can't discard that. And I can't discard that. Okay, let's try again. Well, I definitely can't discard that. 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 Yeah, I think this is probably the best bit of this video because it really gets to the heart of the feeling of Arboretum. Hand obsession, hand desperation, and then the scene afterwards. That's exactly what it feels like to play this game in a nutshell. And it is fiercely competitive without ever being aggressive. Yeah, it's another one. It's competitive, but not mean. And... Again, that sits in that perfect spot for couples games. Yes, I absolutely still own Arboretum. I switched to this version. I'm not sure if that was the right decision. I would absolutely recommend it to anyone looking for a two-player card game. It's also good at three and four, but I tend to play it at two. The decisions are so tense. It's stressful. It's really thinky. 
I, I honestly think, yeah, it's just one of the best couples games. And I think most people would agree with me. And number two is Pandemic, designed by Matt Leacock. Pandemic is a cooperative game where players are working together to defeat a global pandemic. Not only is it a great game, but this is an experience that will bring you closer as a couple. Pandemic creates a unique bond between you and your partner. It's science. If you go through a traumatic experience together, you remember that. I think, you know, I'm overstating it. I don't really get across quite how cooperative and the the importance of discussion in a game of pandemic that unlike some co-op games there is a, a real puzzle to solve together and everyone's input is really important and that's why i love it as a couple's game because i might think to take things one way serena might think to take things another way and it's about compromising and cooperating with each other and finding the best solution to save the world together I'd also recommend Flashpoint Fire Rescue or other co-op games. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Would I still recommend Pandemic? Absolutely. Of course, I still own it. It's one of the first games I do own. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I also really love Pandemic Iberia, Pandemic Fall of Rome. Even the DICE version is great, and then their expansions. It's just such a great system. To me, the best cooperative game ever made, and I'm yet to see one that's does anything better than it. Number one is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, designed by Raymond Edmonds, Suzanne Goldberg, and Gary Grady. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is the original storytelling detective case-solving game from the 80s. Uh, I remember it took me ages to try and get a copy of this game because it was just out of print for so long. Um, I was so happy to get it. You've got the directory where you can look up names of people involved and go and visit them. And you've got a map of London. I think we need to talk to the victim's wife. No, she won't know anything. Let's go to his workplace. It's an easy game to try and describe and get across because it is so interactive with talking with each other. And I think that what's so great about Sherlock Holmes is that it doesn't hand it all to you on a plate. It doesn't tell you these are your options of places to go you can kind of get around it. it. It, You know, there's a little bit of fabrication to that. They're, they're making you believe that you have full autonomy. You don't really, but, you you know, you, they might mention a ring and then you have to in, think, oh, we should go visit the jewelers. It doesn't tell you which jeweler to go to. It doesn't even tell you to go to the jewelers. And that's what I think makes the game more exciting sometimes than its other detective counterparts. I recommend you play this game cooperatively. You're reading out the encounters together anyway, and it's so much more fun trying to decipher it together. Yeah, I mean, I'd forgotten that it's even a competitive game, or at least it was. Maybe they've changed it with the new version. I've only ever played this game cooperative, and I don't worry about the point system. I don't try and beat Sherlock. I just want to solve the case in a way that to me, that feels satisfying. There's no other game out there like it, although I wish there was. <laughs> There's no other game out there like it, though I wish there was. Well, now there are loads, so my wish came true. Would I recommend it? Yes, absolutely. I still, this is the new version of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and I've got the three other boxes. Uh, it's a game that I love. I love playing it with Serena. I think it's a great couples game. We pretty much just only play it together. I love the crime solving genre in general. I, I think this is probably my favorite, but I also really enjoy Chronicles of Crime and Detective of Modern Crime game. This is probably the best place to start. And yeah, I everyone should try one of them at least once. Well, that was me reviewing my old reviews. If you like this video, please let me know in the comments because I could absolutely make more of them. And if you want to see the old videos, there are links in the description below, as well as links to where you can buy the games that were mentioned. If you use those links, a small cut will go towards the channel. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the channel, you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash actual for which you'll get the actual old monthly newsletter. I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching. <laughs>